are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great so far. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so talk a little bit about, uh, I'm legitimately looking forward to this movie. Oh, excellent. Um, and uh, I think people are going to be surprised by it. Mm-hmm. I keep on hearing good buzz uh, from behind the scenes. Uh, when you're telling people about it, like what? how do you t- typically sell it to people? Or how? what do you want to tell people about the movie? Maybe why they should see it or what you're happy with? Well, I, I when... I originally decided to do the movie. I, I had a chance meeting. I, I, Adam Sandler responded to a piece of material I had. And we met in Los Angeles. And as I was leaving, he said, Columbus, take a look at the script. It was a rewrite of something we had called Pixels. I was not familiar with the short. So when I read the script on the way home to San Francisco from L.A., I was blown away by it. And I was blown away by the script for two reasons. One, it was a completely original summer movie. Uh, not based on a, it wasn't a sequel, it wasn't based on a board game or a comic book, it was just an original concept. And the other thing I wanted to do was the opportunity to take these iconic game characters and actually create living, sort of breathing versions of them and create visual effects, and I really mean this, that we haven't seen before. By taking something like Pac-Man, you take Pac-Man, and and Patrick Jean's original short sort of was a springboard for us in visual effects. Very inspiring, beautiful short, but we want to take it to the next level. So how do you do that? How do you turn Pac-Man into a 35-foot creature that is not only destructive and terrifying, but a little charming as well? Well, you, you light him from within, you create these voxelized, pixelized things that are constantly moving, and when he bites through a city bus or a mailbox or your hand, your hand is, it's not t- typical, CGI destruction, it is actually your hand voxelates and pixelates and crumbles. And it's, it's just the coolest imagery I've ever seen. We worked very hard to get it to that point. And you see some of it in the trailer, but in the movie itself, there are, th- there are about a thousand visual effects shots. I think the most important thing that people really need to know is that Peter Dinklage is playing Billy Mitchell. Right, exactly. And I think once people understand that and have seen King of Kong, right. that's it. Um, so it is true, though, he's basically playing... Uh, uh, Billy Mitchell. I don't want to say he's... Ba- I cannot... I, if I say he's playing Billy Mitchell, Billy Mitchell will come to my house and find me. So, uh, no, he's not playing... I, who knows where he was inspired? He was inspired by a lot of 80s icons. <laughs> now, uh, the diplomatic answer. The diplomatic answer. Peter Dinklage, by the way, delivers a performance <laughs> unlike anything you've ever seen. Um, yeah, I heard a story, and maybe you can tell me if this is true or not, that he read the script and was interested... And then he was told, you should go watch King of Kong again because the character is inspired by Billy Mitchell. And then he was like, I, I think I need to watch that movie again. <laughs> <laughs> that might, part of that might be true. Just, I'm, I'm just being very careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, uh, have you done any test screenings? And what did you learn from that process from friends and family screenings or test screenings that possibly impacted the film? Just that the audiences truly love the movie. They love the combination of humor they like the fact that it's not um, what you're what, what they're typically expecting from Adam Sandler in a movie, or you know, it's a completely sort of unique world. A lot of comparisons, and one of the things I was trying to do with the movie, a lot of comparisons to the Amblin movies that I was working on in the '80s. And part of that was, over the years, people have been coming up to me and saying, you know, when are you going to write something like Goonies or Gremlins or do something like that? And I have actually quite, I've, once I did Home Alone, I stopped doing those kinds of movies. And I don't know why, but I realized that there was a real hunger for it. Because by the time I reached, like, it was like 2008 or 2009, no one wanted to talk to me about anything except Goonies. So I realized... <laughs> by okay. the way, there's a reason for that, because Goonies is fucking awesome. <laughs> okay, Come thank on. you. Thank you. But I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I get it. I now have to find a way to embrace my pet. When I read Pixels, I realized we can create that kind of evocative sense of being in a theater in 1985, how you felt when you were in a theater watching those movies. And Josh Gad, when he saw the first, second test screening of Pixels, said, it's the first Amblin movie since 1986. And I was like, "That dude, that is the best compliment you could ever give me. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I think that uh, maybe you watch, recently watched Preston Surge's Sullivan's Travels or something. And right. It was like, Wait a minute! I used to make eight. He's like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really reaching here. There's gonna be a lot of people watching this interview. Interview? I don't know what that will, is. I have no idea who will be like Sullivan's Travels. What? Right? Yeah. Um, they need to see. You need to see Sullivan's Travels. Right. A hundred percent. While I have you, and I want to, I, I have a million other things about Pixels, but I have to ask you. Uh, uh, there's rumors of, of a reboot of Gremlins. Right. Is this actually moving forward? Are you involved? I am involved. 
it's when I did Gremlins, when I finished Gremlins and it, the first Gremlins was released, I was asked to do to write the sequel, and I said, no, there's nowhere else to go. Now this is before the pre-crazy franchise era of Hollywood, when everything is a franchise. So obviously, a long 30 years has passed, and I thought, okay, we can do this. We can actually find a way not to remake the first movie, but to take those characters and do something interesting. I realized. Not from the Star Wars trailers, but I realized from J.J.'s other movies when he did Star Trek, he has a sense of taking that sort of sense of nostalgia that we all want and bringing it forward. Like he brought Leonard Nimoy into the first Star Trek. And to that to me was why we connected to that. And it was painfully obvious when we saw the Star Wars trailer recently that when you saw Han Solo and Chewbacca, we all had tears in our eyes because yeah. we want we want that feeling again. So I thought okay, it's cool. If we can pull it off, if we can create that feeling but deliver something new to the audience, then we can maybe do a really terrific Gremlins reboot. So where are you in the process? It just began the writing process. Oh, so you, are you writing it? No, 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 no. We have a writer writing. Okay, yeah. there, there you go. Um, so are, do you think you're going to incorporate like the real time from the first one? Like the way, or is it sort of new universe, new... Uh, we are going to incorporate some of it, but there'll be some new characters as well. I can't talk a lot about it. I'm sworn to Let, secrecy. Let's move on to the next thing. Okay. Um, I've heard uh, that there is a, actually movement on, and I, it, it's been rumored for a while, but I've actually heard there's movement on a Goonies sequel. It, not, as, not as much movement as there is on the Gremlin sequel, but, and Goonies is a much tougher nut to crack for obvious reasons. So we've been working on it. It always comes up like every five years. We are in the thick of it now, trying to figure it out. But I, I heard that maybe Rich Donner has a story that he's like. There's a story idea that people are happy with. Is that true? Not true? Not yet. We're still. We are still searching. We really? are avidly, but we are. We are searching very hard. Yeah, to try to make it work. But we're not going to let anybody down if we don't feel it's right. And that's between Donner, Spielberg, and myself. If we don't feel it's right, we're not going to do it. Is, I love the music. In this here. is my soundtrack, the exactly. soundtrack of my life. I, I have to ask, though, if you do make a sequel, will it be called Goonies 2, Goonies Never Die? If, if that's what the fans want, that's what we'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> Just because that, that's the title I want. I right. Mean, exactly, but anyway, um, uh, so you basically, so that's really something that could happen. Yes, completely. Legit. Legit. I mean, it's not as far along as Gremlins, but it's something that we all would like to happen. Sure, absolutely. I apologize to everyone listening to this interview with the music. Not intentional. Um, jumping back into Pixels, um, what is... Uh, this is such one of the things I love about the, uh, about the movie, the thing I'm really looking forward to, all the video game characters, the 80s arcade games. Are you guys planning anything like cool involving like arcades or... Do, do you know what I mean? Like, there seems like there's a lot of cool stuff you can do to help promote the movie. Right. Is, have you been involved in any of that? Is any of that coming? The studio is talking about it now, deciding what they're going to do. I don't know if they're going to be rebuilding arcades across the country, because I don't know how well that would go over. But, um, yeah, we're talking about that. There's no definitive answer right now. I would, I'll know more in about four weeks. How long was your first cut, and how long is the finished film? It's not fit. We're not finished yet, but we're about... Uh, our first cut was two hours, and our finished film will probably be around an, uh, an hour and 45 minutes. Is it one of these things where, like, because I would imagine the VFX are not cheap to right. do something like Pixels. Um, is it one of these things where the invasion starts pretty early on, or does it sort of like, we get a, like a sense of the, the characters' lives and everything, and it's like 30 minutes in, all of a sudden shit goes wrong? I think you get a sense of the characters' lives and the invasion, you get a sense of the invasion pretty early on. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was, obviously I haven't seen the film yet, but was there a sequence in the movie that involving all these characters, all this stuff that you're like, I really don't know how we're going to pull this one off. Is it one of those kind of things? Well, it happened, that would have happened early in the process because we had to create animatics, actual animation for each sequence. So each sequence was animated be months before we shot it and that was changed and edited and cut almost like an animated movie so the actors the stunt coordinators we all knew exactly where we had to be on the night that we were shooting it so what seemed like an impossible task four months before we shot it by the time we got to the set we were extraordinarily well prepared um, the question always was how well can we integrate how cool can we get these characters to look how great can they look and that's where we 
broke the bar and I think are, have done a really great job. My last question for you, because I've been giving the wrap-up signal. Uh, I'm a fan of your work. I'm very curious what you might be also working on. Is there other stuff that's bothering you? Um, you know, I'm trying to decide what my next... <laughs> Whoa! Uh, trying to decide what the next movie is going to be. Yeah, I would love the music to stop. Uh, <laughs> but the next the next film, I'm, I, there's a lot of projects out there that I'm thinking about. Yeah, I would imagine you have a, a, your pick. Uh, I would imagine you get to look at a lot of stuff. You do, and you've, you've got to be selective, you know, and I don't know... You know, I just came from a luncheon with Clint Eastwood, so and I'd never met Clint Eastwood. So I, people always ask me, what, how do you see your career? And I'm like, well, I would love to eventually have a career like Clint Eastwood, which means I feel like I'm only halfway done. If I'm lucky enough to continue to make movies into my 80s, I'd love that. And I told that to him, and I said, this is, this is what I want. He goes, I, I really I admire your career more than I admire anyone else's career in Hollywood. And it was a very touching moment for me because I realized that, you know, there's a, there are a lot of ideas out there and a lot of ways to go, yeah. so. 100%. Uh, sir, pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Let me hit stop.